Okay, you can start the live. Yes, ma'am, we are live. Okay, good evening, all of you. Welcome to the monthly TACO CME program. And as we are observing the glaucoma week this time, we are having a very comprehensive talk on management by a national renowned faculty from the prestigious PGI Chandigarh. Dr. Shushmita Kaushik, Professor, Glaucoma Services, Advanced Eye Center, with special interest on pediatric glaucoma. My association with her dates back to my college days. And I remember her as a very young, enthusiastic colleague and happy to see you here. And I came to know recently that she was actually, uh, she was actually, uh, uh, spend, she's actually spent her life uh, childhood in Trivandrum, so she knows a lot of Malayalam, so be careful. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jayashri here, who is our member now, uh, colleague and um, this, uh, a consultant at Narayana Netrale in Glaucoma. She was instrumental in introducing me to Dr. Sushmita again, after so that we can meet after such a long time. So Dr. Jayashri and Dr. Radharamnan will be chairing this session. And I must thank both of them Dr. Jayashree, as well as Dr. Sushmita for responding so quickly for, to this program. Thank you both for coming in and helping us out. And uh, Sushmita, welcome. I don't think you've been in Trishur, so welcome to Trishur and Chako. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Dr. Jayashree and Dr. Radharaman, please take over and let me invite Dr. Grishma to kindly introduce our speaker. Grishma? <laughs> Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our eminent speaker for today, Dr. Sushmita Kaushik. She completed her MBBS from Delhi University. She joined PGA Chandigarh in 2004 and is currently Professor Advanced Eye Center there. She was a former secretary of Locoma Society of India and former pediatric Locoma Society. She has won several awards for best paper, including Dr. D.B. Chandra Award and many more for best poster surgical videos. She has been featured in World Report of Ophthalmology as top 27 women in ophthalmology. She has more than 100 publications in various national and international peer review journals. She is a reviewer of almost all reputed journals and has contributed numerous book chapters in various She is a passionate teacher and her areas of special interest are ankle closure glaucoma, pediatric glaucoma, and newer diagnostic tools. On behalf of TACO, I heartily welcome you, madam. So thank you very much. Should I be sharing my slides? I'm very, very happy to be in Trisur, even virtually. Should I, should I start sharing? Yeah, start with it. Okay. Right, so is that visible now? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Right, so uh, when Dr. Sudha actually, uh, it was a pleasant surprise to have uh, a contact with her and I thought I would just do an overview since it's the World Glaucoma Week and just nuggets of uh, what we do day in and day out when we have patients with glaucoma. So the outline today will be focused on effective screening, on diagnostic tools, and a few management protocols. So why must we bother? Um, there are an estimated 12 million people, it must have gone up to about 15 to 16 million by now, affected by glaucoma in India, and the majority of whom are, missed, are underdiagnosed. And even in developed countries, it's estimated that half of glaucoma sufferers remain undetected. And uh, by 2020, it was expected to be 16 million, and I think we must have crossed that by now by leaps and bounds. So how can we change this scenario? The major element of glaucoma strategy is case detection. Use the opportunity to detect at least the obvious glaucomas. That's all that's required. Clear-cut cases with established functional loss remain undiagnosed, and that's our problem. So I'm quoting Dr. Ravi Thomas, who's our guru in many respects. And he, um, he made no bones about saying that a comprehensive examination is not being performed as a routine. And excuses for incomplete examination, and I quote, is a poor developing country grown or a cost of slit lamps, aplanation, chronometers, and diagnostic lenses moon. And uh, Dr. G. Chandrasekhar at one GSI meeting famously said that if you have the money and the electricity to buy a microscope and a FICO machine, 
then you have the money and the electricity for appellation trigonometry and the slip lamp. So what do we have? We have uh, in our armamentorium the intraocular pressure, the optic nerve head, a bonioscopy, and a visual field examination. The current practice is to use the non-contact tonometer for screening, though it's less reliable. So the rule of the thumb is that it's prudent to check for any high intraocular pressure on Goldman application tonometry, and we usually take that as more than 20. As a caveat, we do not diagnose or manage glaucoma on non-contact tonometer readings, and it's a population screening tool to pick out the ones at risk. Why is gonioscopy important? It's important to remember that patients will represent 87% of those with angle closure glaucoma, and 91% of people bilaterally blind from glaucoma are due to primary angle closure. And I like this picture of this three-year-old girl from our clinic to just emphasize the point that anybody, if you are friends enough, will let you do a gonioscopy. And it's not true that gonioscopy takes a lot of time. So when the posterior part of the trabecular meshwork is visible in less than 90 degrees of the angle, that's what we call an occludable angle. And of course, there's a definition of PACS, PAC, and PACD, for which we need to do a laser eye drop. So the next thing we have is the optic nerve assessment. Of course, you can do examination and assessment of disc photographs, but the problems are they require pupillary dilatation, there's considerable inter-observer variation, and it's highly observer dependent. But at least it separates out the obvious glaucoma from the normals. We're not talking about the plus minus 0.6 cups. We're talking about the 0.9 or total cups, which are also undetected in the population simply because it's silent and central vision is preserved. And finally, we have visual field testing. The major disadvantages, of course, are that it's subjective. It may not be universally applicable, and you get spurious results on initial testing. Nonetheless, field testing has been demonstrated to be the best single discriminator between normal individuals and those with glaucoma. And therefore, a glaucomatous optic neuropathy is usually defined as one with characteristic features and corresponding field defects. So the entity that we know as glaucoma is a chronic optic neuropathy, which has typical structural damage in the optic disc which is usually accompanied by or leads to corresponding functional changes. Raised IOP is a causal factor. It's the only one that can be treated. And I love this sentence. It's neither sufficient nor necessary for the diagnosis. So in a nutshell, the diagnosis is clinical. It requires a comprehensive examination, slip lab, stereoscopic evaluation, application chronometry, bonioscopy, and automatic perimetry if glaucoma is suspected. But imaging is not essential for diagnosis. They may have a role in the follow-up. So who are those who require a diagnosis? Obviously, all glaucomas require a diagnosis. But then they are asymptomatic till the late stages, and the diagnosis of late end-stage glaucoma is straightforward. The problem is by the time it reaches here, it's already late. So best to detect as early as we can Intervention can alter the course of the disease and change the prognosis. So you can bring an, RNA, an RGC uh, decline, which would have gone like this. By intervening earlier in the disease, you hope to bring back the slope to what it is in normal individuals. But though you can't take back what is lost, but at least preserve what you have. So why is it important to diagnose the glaucoma suspect? One is to detect the risk of glaucomatous optic nerve damage early and to lower intraocular pressure in individuals at high risk for the loss of visual function. So which other suspects would you be wary of? You have risk factors, which are an elevated IOP, which would make it an ocular hypertensive, older age, family history of glaucoma, thinner central corneal thickness. And of course, if there is a history of extraneous factors such as steroid use, trauma, pseudo exfoliation, myopia, pigment dispersion, or even ocular surgery. Now, once diagnosed, what do you do? So the fundamental goal of treatment, as we said, is to slow the rate of cell loss to an age-dependent rate. And the risk factors, as we said, for the development and progression are the same as they are for glaucoma itself. So elevated IOP is important because lowering intraocular pressure helps all types of patients, whether it's high-tension glaucoma, 
whether it's normal pressure glaucoma, whether it's ocular hypertension, all the landmark glaucoma studies have shown that in patients in whom the pressure was reduced at lesser risk of progression to glaucoma or lesser risk of progression if glaucoma was already there. Now coming to the question of target IOP, you need to know how much you need to lower it to. And target IOP is actually a primary goal of therapy. So it's set on an individual basis after weighing the risks and benefits of treatment. It represents a range of acceptable IOPs within which the progression of visual field loss will be slowed or halted. So this is an assessment which you're making and you're thinking on the basis of literature, on the basis of what you've seen all these years, that if I bring this pressure down to this much, probably this patient's uh, progression can be slowed. And the IP range should be reviewed and adjusted over the course of treatment as you keep on doing the fields and seeing the state of disease. So step one is assess the severity. Early POAG by definition is a cup to disc ratio of less than 0.7 and you would have very early visual field defects. Moderate POAG would be a CD ratio of 0.7 to 0.85 and no visual field defect in the central 10 degrees. Whereas if you have a uh, cup to disc ratio of more than 0.8, which is 0.9 or total, or a visual field defect in the central 10 degrees, that is what we call an advanced clock. So then you set the target depending on the severity. If it's early POAT, then it's less than 18 or less than 25% from baseline. For moderate advanced nocular hypertension, it would be 15, 12. Moderate POAG would be okay with about 30% reduction and advanced POAG would require about 50% reduction for uh, the disease progression to be, to be slowed. Ocular hypertensives, on the other hand, is enough to have it less than 21 millimeters, and a 20% reduction is often enough. So now we see the target pressure is based upon the initial pressure, the stage of disease, life expectancy of the patient, the rate of damage, and the central corneal thickness, and you maintain functional vision throughout the patient's So in a nutshell, I like this, this schematic. If you have a higher target, so which are the ones you'd have a higher target in which life expectancy is short, which means you have a very elderly patient as opposed to a long visual expectancy. If the damage is early, then your target is higher compared to when the damage is advanced, then your target is lower. And when is the IOP damage? Uh, when, what is the IOP when damage has occurred? It was high, then you're lucky because then your targets can be higher. But if the IOP itself was in the normal range, now that is a problem because then your target IOPs need to be lower. And the other things to factor in is the rate of progression, in CCT, race, et cetera, et cetera. So in 1960, which is more than 80 years ago, Paul Chandler actually said it best said eyes with advanced glaucoma require a pressure below the average. Eyes with limited cupping confined to one pole will withstand pressure better and eyes with a normal disc will withstand pressure well over many, many years. So you know where our focus should be, obviously in the first one, that eyes with advanced damage. So what are the treatments available? The treatments all focus on reducing the intraocular pressure. The eye drops are the most common, followed by laser trabeculoplasty and incisional surgeries. So the most common are prostaglandin analogs, beta adrenergic antagonists, oral and topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and alpha adrenergic agonists. And right now, we've also had ROC inhibitors which have been introduced in India, which we hope will be an addition in the armamentorium of medical management. Laser trabeculoplasty, SLT, works very, very well in a certain group of patients. It lowers IOP by increasing the outflow from the eye, works well for about 50% over five years, and those are the happiest people because they don't need to be on medication. And incisional surgery, trabeculectomies are, uh, are bulldozed work, and echoes drainage device if it's a refractory glaucoma or it's a failed trap. Newer procedures, you do have non-penetrating canaloplasty, ECP, and alternative methods of a bypass of the mix coming in, but nothing really has replaced trabeculectomy. Most mix are said to be equivalent in pressure lowering to one prostaglandin. So overall, what, what, what do all these medical uh, treatments, how do they fare? There's a strong evidence from 50 trials, this is a systemic review, which finds that as single agents, 
PGAs are the most effective at lowering IOP. So there's no question of for India or, uh, or for India, the best drug is a beta blocker. No, whether it's in India, or whether it's anywhere in the world, the fact is PGAs are the most effective. They appear to be similar in their ability to lower IOP, so there's not much between them and the lower IOP more than the other regions. So I'll just give a quick comparison. So from, from Remodidine, the mean difference is about 1.64 millimeters. From Dorsalamide, the difference of 2.64 millimeters. And Timolol, it's 5% greater at six months. But in combination, a Dorsalamide Timolol lowers the IOP at about the same amount. So the other thing is the surgical intervention. Laser trabeculoplasty is a kind of surgery. With regard to incisional surgery, TRAB more effectively reduces IOP than non-penetrating surgeries. And intraoperative MMC enhances IOP reduction when used with TRAB, but not when used with other surgical methods. So this really is, uh, is our standard trabeculectomy, which is a gold standard. We usually use a, a clear corneal traction suture rather than a superior rectus, which we used to earlier. So this preserves the superior rectus. It uh, inhibits bleeding. There's no bleeding here. And it gives us very good exposure as well. So this is, uh, this is how much the exposure we get. Uh, usually, phonics-based flaps are the norm. So we do a small uh, peritomy at the limbus. And it's more cutting just at the limbus. And the rest, you'll realize that we're really pushing the Tenons away rather than cutting too much because you want as little bleeding as possible. So this is what I meant. We push the tenons away from the limbus. So, sorry. So the next thing we do is very, very light pottery, only on the blood vessels, taking care that scleral shrinkage doesn't happen too much. But you do want a bloodless field for you to be making your scleral flap. And then that is the standard scleral flap that is made. I use triangular flaps, but they could be rectangular. They could be any shape. It hasn't really mattered. We try to keep away from the limbus because you have the limbal stem cells there and the conjunctiva heals much better. I use a crescent blade now, but I used to use a 15 number knife, which worked just as well. I find the crescent blade has a little smoother edge to it. So we like it. So as you can see, we are going centrally in the, uh, in the clear cornea, but we are not going through the entire trabecular meshwork there. Um, now, this is MMC. This is uh, Peng Hogg's uh, technique of the safer surgery system of Morfields, where it is into the fornix, large uh, sponges, and we take care that we don't really put the MMC near the edge of the conjunctiva. So once that's done, this is a small trick that uh, we do. We uh, score the limbus a little bit, make it raw. So the conjunctiva sticks very well and we haven't had conjunctival retractions and leaks ever since we did that. I like putting a paracentesis. Each surgeon has their own preference. A paracentesis is parallel to the limbus and a long tunnel. It's nice to inject pilocarpine and constrict the pupil. And also in case I need to put in viscoelastic because you don't want hypotony at any cost. And at the end of the surgery, it's a nice way to flush the anterior chamber and to flush out the debris. So you can see the pupil has nicely constricted here, a little bit of air bubble, that's all right. So it makes it better because the iris is out of the way. One stab incision, I usually use a Kelly sponge to make the sclerostomy, but Avana scissors will work as well. So whatever one is comfortable with, Usually two to three punches of the of the Kelly sponge is enough. And then a PI, and that's about it. You can see how stable the anterior chamber is. And uh, that's it. And then you just suture it. We use releasable sutures all the time. It has made the post-operative management of a trabeculectomy bleb so much easier because of that. And we can do tight suturing with this. So I'll just move it a little forward. So here you are. That's the releasable suture being put in. Uh, this is what I do. I make a shoelace here and I take the, the bite through the clear cornea so that the loop is there next morning or the next few days. This is what I was saying, flushing it at the end. So just a little bit of flush and uh, hydrating the port. And we are done because we are sure that... So just before tightening it, I see that there is a, a, a filtration. And then I use two wing sutures on either side to... Uh, bring down the conjunctiva tightly. I don't like to do a, 
a continuous suture, but some surgeons do. So whatever suits you, this has suited us well. One millimeter over the cornea, and there's the PI, and that's the end of the procedure, really. So you can see that uh, if there's an additional frill, I might just cut it a little bit, just to uh, be sure that it's not too much on it, and then that's about it, because all, all interval flaps would retract a little bit. So um, incisional surgery lowers intraocular pressure more than laser surgery or medications. And the initial treatment tends to low, reduce the need for medications to achieve the same IOP. So the treatments for angle closure glaucoma, now this is not single disease, it's a spectrum. It's primary angle closure suspect, angle closure, as well as angle closure glaucoma. The mainstay is laser iodotomy across the spectrum. And once the pupillary block is relieved, this is the easiest caveat to remember. The principles of treatment are much the same as that for open angle glaucoma. So um, PACD has also been classified as acute, subacute, and chronic. PACS, synechial, and appositional. And PACS, we do a laser iodotomy only selectively. Fellow eyes of acute angle closure, angle closure glaucoma in the fellow eye, family history of angle closure, need for repeated dilatations if they have a retinal problem, one eyed patient. And I put this right at the bottom, poor access to regular ophthalmic areas is not a nice indication for doing LI, but then that's what we usually do. So coming to drainage devices, it's an alternative surgical approach. It draws aqueous out to the drainage tube away from the eye. The valve GDD is the Ahmed, the non-valve is the Barwell. In India, we have the Orolab aqueous drainage implant, which is on the same principle. There is also the Maltino, which is not available in India. So this would be the the real potpourri of when I would probably do a primary tube and not do a trabeculectomy post PK, post PPV, post bad cataract surgery with a lot of synechia, neovascular glaucoma, ICE, and sometimes a lot of uveitis with scleritis in which the conjunctiva is completely scarred. So this is what the AGV is. This is my prized possession. It's a drawing by uh, Ahmed himself when he had come to India at the Bhopal AIOS. And he sat me down and he explained the working of the valve. So I preserved this. And this is the model of the RD 350 millimeter square. The principles are the same. An incision is made in the conjunctiva, pocket is created, implant is placed between the conjunctiva and sclera, and the drainage tube is trimmed and inserted into the anterior chamber or the sulcus or even the past plane iodides. Now, this is something which I share with most people. We, um, we finally, the glaucoma is on the task force of the National Program of Control of Blindness. Believe it or not, before three years, glaucoma was not even in the NPCB, but now it is. And uh, together with Dr. Ramanji, Dr. Panda of ourselves and, uh, and a couple of others, we've made this information sheet on glaucoma management, which is a snapshot and it's easy. Uh, we encourage everybody, all ophthalmologists, to have it on their slit lamp next to them. So that you just need to look up and see what to do. And it pretty much explains the whole thing. I'll go through it one by one. So uh, one out of 20 people over 40 years is likely to be a glaucoma suspect or have glaucoma. That's the most important thing. When would you think of glaucoma? You suspect it on the basis of optic nerve. You suspect it on the basis of shallow AC or iris changes. So if the cupping is more than 0.7, asymmetry is more than 0.2, or there's a knot, we suspect glaucoma. You have a shallow AC on torchlight. This is a shadow test. And this is a van herix. Please suspect angle closure. Now do the tonometry. Repeat it thrice at least. If it's between 14 to 18 millimeters and the angles are open, then it's a POAG suspect. If it's a narrow angle, a PAS, then it's PACS or PAC. If the IOP is between 18 and 20, it's narrow angles, peripheral anterior sinica, field defect, that's PACG, and if it's open angles plus a field defect, it's POAG. So that's so for these, you need a bilateral lag PI, optic nerve changes, and perimetry to determine the final diagnosis, and then think of a target IO. So what next? So medications are given based on the initial highest IO. If it's less than 25 millimeters, you just give a prostaglandin, look for at least 15% reduction in IOP. If it's not more than at least 15%, that drug is not working. Call them back in about four weeks, switch one or two drugs if a non-responsive. Again, look for at least a 15% drop. So before we add on, we must switch drugs within the same class and only then add. 
If it's between 25 to 30, again, we would give a prostaglandin, mainly because this glaucoma has been there for a long time and there's no need to panic. Wait for 10 days, add drugs depending on whether your first drug is effective or not. If you start with a cocktail, you'll never know which drug is working and what really you should add. And if it's more than 30, we usually do start with Diamox. After 10 days, add the modernine or carbonic anhydrase along with the, with the uh, initial ones. And then look at the target IOP and probably start looking at surgery depending on what the disdanges are like. So what intraocular pressure is adequate? We've looked through this. If it's an early defect like this, then 15 to 17 is good. If it's a moderate defect, then you need to be lower at 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. But if it's a severe defect like this, a 0.9 cup and a 10 2 being a compromise, then you need to be in really low teens. So, what next? Review and revise all the time, increase or decrease depending on the stability of the disease. If target is not achieved or there's progression, or you think that the social economic status is not going to let him continue with medical management, please consider trabeculectomy or referral to a center where trabeculectomy is done. These are the principles of trabeculectomy that I've just shown you. I can't uh, not bring my babies in because um, now the clinic is full of their laughter. I have babies coming preterm, babies coming a couple of hours old. We operate all of them. We hold their hands until they grow up, go to school. And uh, some of them don't want to go back into the adult clinics, even though they've become adults. So just a snapshot of what we do. This is the typical, you can see the vernix caseosa is still there. So this is a couple of hours old. They come with cute glaucomas or cute um, high drops. Also, we operate them as much as possible, as soon as possible. When we make friends with children, they let you do anything. So this is a slit lamp. This two-year-old is letting me look into his disc. This He's letting me also do an aplanation tonometer. And I showed you that little girl who lets me do her gonioscopy as well. So we do pretty much everything with these children. The minute they can start sitting on the slit lamp, we examine them as we would examine anybody else. Most of these are on lifelong follow-up. These children are all going to school now. They came to me as babies. So um, to just summarize, it's desirable to detect cases at a state where optic neuropathy is yet to develop. And there's reasonable certainty that treating this particular patient will prevent glaucoma, but that's utopian. We can't really do this. We're not equipped to tackle patients like that. What is doable is to diagnose established glaucoma at a stage where treatment can prevent blindness in the patient's lifetime. That's the only thing that we can do. Hold their hands together and make sure that they don't lose more than they have already lost while they're under our care. A comprehensive eye exam is our cornerstone to achieve this goal. And a rational treatment, depending on the type and the severity of glaucoma, is likely to preserve the visual function in their lifetime. Thank you so much from all of us here at Chandigarh. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Susmita. Actually, it was, I was so anxious, actually, uh, how you are going to present the whole uh, thing in half an hour. But I am surprised that it has covered almost everything and uh, it is very useful for the practice. And it's not that easy to put everything in half an hour or uh, 25 minutes time. So that was beautifully presented. Thank you. Thank and uh, I think a lot of people have a lot of uh, 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 that was Jayasri, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, ma'am. Exactly the same thoughts I was also sharing. Uh, like, it was like, it was like a humongous task to come in. Think about glaucoma in 30 minutes. Like, uh, you have actually covered that entire topic and so much to learn in that too. Like, so many topics, so many nutshells, so many tips. And this has been the... Um, Trade Madam has. Whenever she presents, she gives so much of uh, information. It's always a pleasure here listening to you, Madam. Thank you. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Entirely. And uh, uh, discussing about the target IOP. Yes. Think, uh, this is one point. Uh, sometime I even discuss with uh, my uh, juniors because uh, sometimes it people get into an adamant stage of uh, target IOP. Mm. So. Uh, I used to tell them the target IOP is only for your beginning, you know, 
and the rest of the thing as it comes True. so after that there is no target iop uh, which you going to tell it is what the patient is going to tell what your opinion about that so the target as uh, you know is a range and uh, there is no one target for any one thing because there are so many factors that come. So, so I always tell my residents also, if I have an 80-year-old person, I probably have to tide over just about 10 years more of their life. And there are sometimes some normal pressure glaucomas who I know it is glaucoma, but I don't treat them because it's such a slow-growing disease. The treatment is going to be more troublesome for that poor guy with arthritis, with a stent, with all that. And I say, it's okay, his 2021 20, pressures are not going to make him blind in the next 10 years. But then if we have children, we need to tide over 80 years of their life and we, are, we go whole hog and we are very, very aggressive. So target IOP really depends so much on the individual patient right in front of you. And the other thing that really, really matters is the rate of the progression, which we don't look at. Some glaucomas progress very fast. So if it's pseudo exfoliation, I'd be very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, aggressive with my targets because I know I would I would err towards doing a phaco trap early because I know pseudo exfoliation would progress so so fast whereas some of the uh, POAGs just don't progress at all maybe over two three years so you don't need to be so target IP is very fluid and it's it's not a, it's an idea that you have when the patient comes to you that look I think I would keep you here. And that's what I tell them. But I will look at how you do with that. And if you progress at a target which I thought was okay, I will intervene more. And if you don't progress at all, we'll keep it at that and hope for the best. So it's a very dynamic thing. As you correctly pointed out, I think uh, sometimes youngsters get into some confusion on uh, this thing because when we put it all these guidelines and uh, it is 0.8 cup and uh, IOP is only uh, reduced to <clears throat> 20 and sometimes people jump into very aggressive things yes. and uh, see, look at the uh, patient's clinical uh, findings. Patient is very stable in the last three or four years. Yes. And uh, so that is what is from the beginning target is okay. As you yeah. explained, uh, after that, we have to observe it. Uh, so like uh, sometime I used to tell my uh, juniors, it is like a uh, glaucoma is always uh, driving uh, through a nationalized highway. So <laughs> you have to obey the rules of the highway, yeah. with the lines and everything. But not like in a railway track. Yeah. Railway track, you cannot go a little bit to that side or this side. So okay. some difference is there. It's like uh, obeying the traffic rules, driving the uh, highway like that. Uh, you have to go a little bit on this thing. And if you are uh, driving without a road or this thing, you are really in trouble. So uh, this point, I think I, I am just uh, telling this thing to just point to out. that a little clear, Sushmita, what exactly do you monitor to say this is progressing or not? Is it the, the shop or, is it, or the, the field? Visual fields. Progression is, is, yeah, because it's very difficult to uh, uh, doing, I mean, either you have these pictures every uh, visit, we do, but even then it's very, very difficult to structurally make out a little bit of an increase or a decrease in not. There are variations in lighting. There are all sorts of things, variation in optom, variation in the angle in which it was taken. But the visual field is a patient's function and it's something which is easy for that patient to understand. So, of course, like today itself, we had a patient education seminar in uh, PGI. And I was telling them that, look, if you're going to sit on the visual field machine, and I told them that 99% of the effort is yours because you are 100% for yourself, but you are only one of 56,000 glaucoma patients registered in my clinic. So, you see, you see the commitment that I have for you is equal to the others that I have, but you are only committed mm -hmm. to yourself. So, if you don't press the button of the visual field, because you're thinking of uh, what is going to be cooking at home or whether I'll be able to get to office in time. The machine doesn't know that. And it will be shown up as a black spot. And I have 200 patients sitting outside and I'll say it's progressing and I'll add a drug. Unnecessarily, you will have another drug. You'll have an expense. You'll have bad ocular surface for no rhyme or reason. So visual field is so, so important. And now with at least we do the Humphreys, the glaucoma progression analysis is so good 
it tells you it's it's screaming at you hello there is possible progression hello there is likely progression you don't even have to do anything except just look at it and read so yes we would look at visual fields the other thing that we have is the vfi visual field index i couldn't but rather i couldn't cover visual fields in detail as much as i would have liked to but you have something called a vfi which is a visual field index which is a trend based analysis it's a lovely thing that comes on that one summary where it tells you the slope so if you see the slope is straight you are fine you suddenly see the slope is going right down you show the patient that you said see you were here and now you're here now are you sure that you did the fields all right or should i take you off for surgery no 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 i'll do it again i wasn't very attentive so sure enough that the slope gets back so these things happen it's a it's a dynamic you know a, a give and take both sides very difficult for glaucoma patients but once you tell them that you're responsible the other problem so that that we've seen is that they put their so we used to have a triage for the uh, you know when, when it opened up and uh, it was covid but they, they had to come and give their phone numbers and name and everything so my triage resident tells me that you know what your patient comes and he comes with brand new drops and he says you tell me how to put this he says you go up they, they'll tell you what to put No, 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 madam. Will ask me how are you putting? I have no idea. I forgot. So he's not putting any drops, but he's carrying brand new drops because madam is going to ask. Tell me. So that's another thing we do. So that's another scare because I ask them every time. I don't care what is written on your card. You show me what you're putting. So all of them have to get their drops and tell me. So he was revising each day because he just bought it. He wasn't. The other problem is that they put it two days prior to coming. So I tell them that. I said, look, you're progressing. but your pressures are 12 so if you are going to cheat yourself i am not going to be able to help you so if you are not going to put your drops for 3 months and put it in the last 3 days your pressures here might be same but i am going to then again to do a surgery because i am going to think you are progressing so some of them are a little sheepish because these things happen adherence compliance are issues which we have to remember that the patients do have and i understand they have problems but then you know it's a it's i don't know i'm sure we over treat i'm sure we under treat i'm sure we do all sorts of things as well it's not that but we can only try doing the best that we can for them and the other thing dr dr radha the other thing is um, when we talk of up to this ratio again i didn't i didn't dwell on that optic disc size so so important you have a small disc a 0.5 or a 0.6 cup is so significant because it's crowded and you're not picking up the glaucoma and yet you have a large 2.5 mm disc and a 0.8 cup which is completely normal simply because there's so much space for all the rnfl to go through and yet that patient is on four drugs uh, hello why are you on travacom and simrins i don't know my doctor said i have advanced glaucoma advanced glaucoma 15 pressures but a large disc and a 0.8 cup so these are it's very difficult to then you know take them off and say you mean he just gave it <laughs> so all those funny questions come in i'm sure all of us uh, face these i put more patients off medication than on them when they come to me for the first time a lot of it's called what what is it called over treated and under diagnosed that's the conundrum of glaucoma problems that we have yeah uh Doctor Susmita, actually, you pointed yeah. out very correctly about uh, this uh, adherence of this uh, treatment. Actually, this produces lot of confusion in most of the uh, yes. cases. Actually, yes. really, you sometimes you will be ashamed that uh, you 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 have added another drug, and after some time you realize this. This happened to me many times, and uh, when you go uh, take the history and all this thing. Another point I want you just. Uh, Told me that the field you will take it at uh, regularly and uh, this thing. But in all this thing, you have never mentioned about the OCT. But nowadays, I will be seeing OCT, 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 and uh, never a patient is taken for field. So this trend is going on increasing. And what is your uh, point on uh, OCT base? Uh, so OCT is not something to diagnose glaucoma. On. There is no question about that. but it's very very useful for uh, for follow up and it's very useful to show the patient sometimes you know sometimes you do have patients who simply cannot do visual things for some strange reason they just don't understand 
what to do and what not. So it's a it's another handy tool I have. It's it's a prop that I can hold on to. He's not doing his fields. I've tried for the last five times. This fellow doesn't understand. But at least the OCT is stable. So at least if there is no structural. So I use it more for a structure. So our workflow is they come, it's refraction and then visual field and then OCT and display and then they come to me. Every visit. So I have OCT on every time. But the problem is that I use it just for that. If the fields are fine, I don't even look at the OCT. It's okay. But OCT needs to be understood. So I don't usually like putting it in, uh, in a glaucoma talk where I think it is so clinical. And OCT, a little bit of red and they're on two drugs. It's so easy to just write Travacom because it's some red thing somewhere. And it turns out that they had a retinal laser for a BRVO and therefore there is a little bit of a quadrantic thinning. So they would be thinning for hundreds of things. But non-glaucomatous optic nerve cupping would always be red. Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy would always be red. But, you know, the red means glaucoma and green means normal is what is really let us down where glaucoma diagnosis is concerned. When we have optic disc hemorrhages also with RNFL defects, the OCT is green because the, the hemorrhage has extravasated and the silly machine doesn't know that the thickening is because of extravasated blood. But it is green and they are fine. And there are times when I say, you have a disc hemorrhage. You, you, are, you are glaucoma unless proven otherwise. But no, no, I have an OCT, which is green. So that's why I don't bring this into the clinical armamentarium. Huge uh, help, yes. But only once the doctor directs that I want an OCT for this, then not otherwise. So you are... Telling that it is not for the diagnosis, but uh, not for the diagnosis at all. Big tool for would... uh, follow up. Actually, it's a good, useful for follow ups. For follow ups, yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's wonderful. You get a structural uh, thing. It gives you a lot of confidence, especially if the fields are not too great, and even the, especially in the early glaucomas where the fields may be almost iffy and might be almost normal. So, if I have an ocular hypertension who I'm not treating. I'll be very happy to know and tell the patient there is no change. So that debate is always out whether or not an OHD should be treated. And my take is if I see change in OCT or change in field, I will treat. But if there's no change, I won't. So it's very useful for the suspects, for the ocular hypertension, because their fields are usually normal. So in that subset of patients, it's very useful. But again, I don't diagnose based on OCT at all. I would diagnose based on clinical exam. Madam, do you follow the uh, GPA of OCT? Yes. I follow both the GPA and the visual field. The GPA is the one which tells me likely progression or possible progression. So I use the GPA summary. So I have the first two fields on top. I have the VFI in the middle and I have today's field at the bottom. And today's field also has the GPA. So I use only the summary page, which is transferred by, we have the forum software. So it's very, very useful to have that. And I have it on my computer every time a patient comes. That's why I want them to do all this before they come to me. So that I have a sense of what to do when they come. Uh, Madam, this GPA is like a HbA1c. When you <laughs> Why? Why would you say that? No, even they put drops before coming to the OPD, yeah. the pressure will be low. Huh. But they cannot fool with the GPA. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what I tell them. But look, if you're going to put your drops two days before coming and not put it for the four months prior, now I'm going to say that you're progressing on 12 pressures and undertaking surgery for you. Do you want that? <laughs> no, 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 we'll put drops. <laughs> sure enough, they're fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One problem in our place is that these people don't come with corrections. Yes. Don't, uh, then your field, I think, becomes very inaccurate if you're not corrected for. Yeah. They have to have a have a refractive refraction prior, and the newer Humphrey, the uh, uh, I think HFA three, has uh, in fact a liquid crystal, where it just changes if you just put in the uh, the refractive error. You don't even need to put the rim of the glasses. The whole machine itself changes according to the refractive error. So those rim artifacts have disappeared with the newer machine. 
But yes, a refractive error is really a must because they have to have good near vision. Or... This entire thing uh, doesn't work for children. So how do you <laughs> actually so assess children, the children, uh, children, so that is such an interesting thing. We put them on at about five years or six years. So since these guys have been on the slit lamp since they're two years old or three years old, they realize that that's another thing. And it would amaze you at how good they are. They're much better than some of our Matajis and Babajis, I can tell you. Because they are so good with the with video games and their, you know, their fingers are so agile because of the mobiles. So they understand it. And if they understand it, they do it very well. So having said that, doing is not a problem. The problem that I was facing was somehow the fields were worse than I thought it would be. And when I looked at them, I actually gave a thesis. And the interesting part is that the visual sensitivity increases along with the visual development till about 12 years of age. So when we compared it to normal children, the visual field was bad. And the 10 year old and 12 year old became better. So if you're going to do a child with glaucoma, you have to keep that in mind that the visual field is worse than an adult of that uh, uh, same RNFL thickness. So the fields in children actually interpreting it is, is a huge. Once they're 12 years old, I'm fine. Then it's I can uh, compare it to the normative database. The main problem is the normative database of children is not there. Okay. Dr. Ramanal said, same as the, in the OCT, I use the visual fields as a follow-up of the same time. I don't compare that to normative database of adults. So in that sense, I know that whether the visual function of, the, of that particular child is, is how it is progressing. But the funny part is it's the only glaucoma where the visual field gets better. Because the sensitivity of the retina gets better with it. So we couldn't understand that. And now we're sort of trying to figure out that Acha, that is a problem. So, oh, so that's a, a, yeah, that, that yeah. is so 12 years and above is good. Yeah, but right. till 12, remember, the function is be getting better, actually. So it's very difficult to interpret over trend. Yes, yeah, the compass and the visual field improves. Both happens. After Sorry. treatment, I mean the cupping also reverses. No, ma'am. After a treat, IOP oh, reduction. The happens. cupping that reverses is mechanical. Yes, it mm -hmm. does not lead to retinal ganglion cell recovery. True. So that we must understand that it's mm -hmm. a mechanical because it's an elastic lamina, so it just comes back. With Three bones. Back. See that with the axial length in babies. So mm -hmm. it was going up, and we we monitor that along with the normative data, uh, normative growth. And the excellent actually comes down a little bit. So it both expands as well as comes back. We were discussing this in the journal club yesterday. We're talking about neuroprotection and neuroregeneration in adults, not uh, children. Children, we know it happens. So like uh, whether it is actually working in adults. So the only thing, conclusion was that only IOP control itself. Is the else best really neuroprotector. Yes. Yes. Brimonidine also, the basic consensus was that brimonidine also is not very good, or at least not uh, not proven in clinical studies. I think there are mice experiments which said it worked, but in clinical studies they haven't been shown. So uh, netasudil uh, rock inhibitors are supposed to have some neuroprotective activity. They seem to be a mana from heaven. They are like uh, uh, conventional outflow inhibition. Uh, I mean, the conventional outflow, um, uh, this thing, it enhances. Then ocular blood flow, it is supposed to enhance. Then the optic nerve perfusion is supposed to get better. And they have neuroprotection also. We said, wow, I mean, this is like, I wish it was. It's too early to say. <laughs> it's just too good to be true. But we're happy with the netasudil actually in some of the very advanced glaucomas where I'd be very hesitant to operate. Netasudil has brought down the pressures. If we can just convince them about the redness, that's the problem. Otherwise, netasudil seems to work all right. So let's see. And do you see the corneal changes like her? I haven't seen actually. I've read so much about it. No, mm -hmm. I really, really look for them. Oh, we have seen them. You've seen? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Vatisalata or something. What, what have you seen? Honeycombing. 
Ah, honey combing itself. But it what is this? So it uh, repairs it. It it was with repairs it. Yeah. Okay. It reverse of uh, reverses after we stop after stopping. Mm. So okay. reparsodil, they've also been given for fuchs uh, endothelial dystrophy. Uh -huh. And true, they true. say that, I mean, it's mm. ulta. They say that the endothelium gets better. Then why should there be honeycomb? I don't know. God knows what happens. I, I have no idea. Mm. Now, how long did it, I mean, how long were the drops put before you found those corneal changes? Well, it's a matter of months only. I mean, we have I mean, oh. actually recently started and uh, it uh, immediately reverses also. It didn't, didn't take much time. Does it affect vision? Patient. No, no, it was predominantly inferiorly. Maybe the uh, that inferior portion the only dropped. Oh, yeah. uh, contact area. Hmm. Okay. Any other? Uh, Madam, one uh, thing about the screening, uh, like uh, it would be better if we uh, also concentrate on the targeted screening. Like uh, if the patients, uh, if we detect a patient um, as a glaucoma, immediately we ascertain that the patient bring their uh, family members also Correct. and um, ask them so, I mean, so that the patient now knows the uh, difficulties with having glaucoma. And if we immediately tell them this, this is possible to happen in the family, there is a high chance that the family members can come immediately and they also get uh, Detected, so screening becomes more. Uh, yes. what you, you will be better. True, but Jashree, let me tell you, they feel very heartbroken when you tell them the husband is not a family. Uh, <laughs> I brought him. <laughs> it's not hundred percent. Family is mother, brother, children, sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you have to specify that family means this, not your spouse. spouse yeah. is not, <laughs> oh, every time spouse we take is not a family. <laughs> True, ma'am. Every time we take a history, like anybody in your family has glaucoma? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> My husband. <laughs> How worried about are you about this snuff out phenomena in trap doing in advanced cases? I, I'm touching a lot of wood, Sudha, but I we've had haven't had snuff out. Maybe because so we've understood call. we've understood it better. We've understood that you have to avoid hypotony at any cost during surgery. So it's very tight suturing, it's viscoelastic, it's keeping the, you know, so I think what, what happened with the snuff out was a differential IOP and sudden IOP lowering. If you do surgery in a 40 millimeter eye and then you put a stab incision and become zero, that is when you will have a snuff out. But now we know that. Manitol before every surgery, get the pressures down, wait a while, give them Dimox, let the pressures come down and intra-op, no hypopnea at all. So I think we've just over time, everybody has understood the mechanics of trap better. So maybe that's the reason we don't see them. But so any advanced fields you are willing to uh, yes. go in? For? Yes, of course, the heart is in our mouth and we tell them that, look, I'm seeing you. And usually they understand that because you start with the 10-2 and then it goes smaller mm -hmm. and smaller. And I said, look, this is all that you have and your pressures are already 12. And the only thing I can do now is surgery because I want to reduce the fluctuation completely. Then they understand. They, so. Oh, even with low IOP, you go in for surgery to reduce. Yes, because a trabeculectomy is the only one in which you can enhance outflow and get it lower than that. I don't think any medication can get it less than 13, 12. We don't get pressures below that. No, but then and what the advantage other, are you getting? Uh, so we do get pressures lower, but the main advantage is no fluctuation at all. Because it's a constant outflow that is happening. So the tabs, even in normal dental glaucomas, the tabs do work. Yeah. And uh, we've started giving them, in, uh, for the very advanced glaucomas, I've started giving them a combination of cyanocobalamin, which the neurologists give for neurodegenerations. And somehow, I, I think it's wishful thinking, early days yet, no randomized trials or anything. I've just given it to the advanced ones. But they seem to be happier when they come. They said, okay. And then I wonder why it's okay because pressure. So maybe it is 14 only. Right? Okay, huh? Up better. Okay. How much? How, what is the dosage? So one, one tablet only. It's ME, ME12. So uh, that, that's the formulation that has cyanocobalamin and a lot of antioxidants. Atram -atram. I just took it from one of the neuro ophthalmology journal clubs. And they said it has stabilized after starting ME12. So the glaucoma guys, antenna is up. Anything that is beneficial for neurology, I grab on. When I said, I might as well use it. So, citicoline, I tried. Citicoline, I didn't find anything. I don't know whether it worked or not. But 
So a lot of our neurologists are giving citicoline as well. Our pediatric ophthalmologists are giving it for amblyopias. They say that the lateral geniculate body apparently works better. So they said, okay, let's try that as well. These are the two. We don't really know, but we are willing to try anything that works, if it works. But this B12, I think we do have a lot of B12 deficiency, which we don't look for. So probably the, the cyanocobalamin is working because of that. Because I'm sure if we measured B12 levels, we would see a lot of low B12, especially up north where there's a lot of vegetarian diet. So a lot of them would be B12 deficient, I think. And and can you for how, um, sorry, sorry, sir. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, continue for uh, how long? Okay. Um, okay. Any how do you, how long? The... I'm so sorry. <laughs> Madam, any role of neurobion? I don't know, sir, actually. I don't <laughs> even know whether there's any role for anything, actually. I, I would have no problem in giving anything, but I there's no evidence. Let me put it that way. There's no randomized trial to say one or the other. So I, I, if it works, well, why not? Why, why can't we give neurobio as well? I mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, you, you just pointed out that uh, snuff off is uh, very rare in your hands. And it's a very good thing, actually. Uh, I had a few cases earlier, actually. Like you pointed out, uh, sometime it, uh, due to uh, good control, without a good control of IOP taken for surgery. And uh, after one point, I just made a point that uh, whenever I enter the uh, um, eye, mm -hmm. I won't take off the uh, knife, whatever is I Correct. thought of. Or I Correct. keep it there for some time. Some time. Some time. Slow, time slow egress. Very nice. We always use a very long tunnel so that you know you don't go in like that. And it's always parallel to the limbus. So it's a long tunnel which goes in. The other thing is it it protects against accidentally touching the lens in case they are faking. That's the other thing. But uh, I think we've just learned it better over the years. We've learned. So, for instance, we've learned that the higher pressures post-operatively are the ones which work better. So, if you have pressures between your mid-teens, when we started off with, we used to be very happy with pressures of five and six on the first post-op day. But those are the traps which didn't do so well as much as the now. So tight suturing, releasable sutures or suturolysis or whatever. So those things have, have made the traps a little better. I think. I think it has become better with time as we've understood it. Any other questions? And do you uh, use pre-place suture in flank? No, no, I don't place pre-place suture. I use viscoelastic before uh, punching it. So it's a formed AC. Mm -hmm. and through the paracentesis, but I don't use pre so It stays, it doesn't collapse. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Susmita, for this. Uh, My pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Also, a part of uh, Kerala, actually, you are, you belong to Kerala. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, <laughs> no question. <laughs> I, I love my stay there. <laughs> I uh, come only. I've come only once after that. The GSI in Kovalam. Yeah, I haven't come after that. Yeah, you're you most welcome to come to Trishu anytime. Yeah, I would love it. I would love it absolutely. <laughs> next next year, all in the conference is in Kuchin. Welcome, all to Kuchin. Sure, I'll I'll be there. I don't miss any of these outings. I've been missing them last two years. I'll come to Kuchin. Yeah, sure. Very very nice talk, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so and uh, I mean, we listen to glaucoma almost every other day, but every time I think I get some new uh, yeah. information. So yes, this all, <laughs> something or the other always comes up. Your practical tips, the experts true. talk something. It's uh, something which you don't. I mean, you really can't miss. You need all these in your daily routine. So much of glaucoma, and we are still not able to <laughs> get a yeah, full true. So they say that it's one Everest, but there are so many yes. different ways to look at it. So yes. the perspectives are so important. I agree. I listen to everybody all the time. And I pick up little, little, oh, even that little thing of doing a raw area of the limbus. I remember it was some webinar somewhere I heard. I said, well, what a good idea. So I started doing that. <laughs> yeah. 
little things. So, Dr. Sujada, you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to offer a vote of thanks today. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Sushmita Kaush, uh, Professor P.J. Chandigarh, for her uh, excellent presentation. Uh, it, as Dr. Jayashri said, there was a lot of uh, natural, so many clinical uh, uh, newer uh, points which we understood. But what I like more is your uh, more practical tips, like uh, what you said about use the opportunity to detect at least obvious glaucoma, uh, what is desirable, what is doable, and more of more. And that you, you need to make the patient also responsible for the treatment. The tips you gave about the uh, field testing is really great, madam. We will use it. <laughs> we need it. We needed it. We got a lot of practical uh, points. So many. Uh, wonderful. My pleasure. Uh, thank you, madam. For in the, on you. behalf of every TACO member, I thank you again. Now I would like to thank our uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Radha Ramanan, uh, for uh, and uh, Dr. Jayasri, consultant uh, Narayan Netral, and uh, for agreeing to be the chair, chair to chair this session and uh, and contribute actively to the discussion. Uh, I would like to thank the senior faculty and all of you have, who have attended this and made this a great success. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gobal Gobal Espilla. Uh, uh, Secretary KSO is for uh, providing the Zoom link and Dr. Tanu for the technical support. I would like to thank each and everyone once more. Thank you. Have a nice day. Tanu, can you stop the live? Tanu? You're still being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh